going to talk about um, For mean curvature flow, minimal surfaces, expanders, and shrinkers. So these are self-similar solutions. Um, they are of the type uh, that we looked at yesterday. Um, and again, the, uh, the point is to create uh, examples uh, that illustrate the theory or that show that certain things happen. Or do, um, and so the particular kinds that I'm going to look at today are will be hypersurfaces in Rn, where Rn will be Rp cross Rq. And I'm going to look at uh, uh, surfaces that are rotationally symmetric, that are uh, invariant with respect to rotations in RP and rotations in RQ, uh, which uh, reduces the problem of finding minimal surfaces, expanders, or shrinkers, again, to ordinary differential equations. And so, the, uh, so in this case, uh, we have two dimensions to play with, and the class of examples is, uh, is richer than what you have in the, uh, the case that I looked at yesterday. Um, so, to begin with, um, all the services I'll be looking at are uh, invariant on in the rotation, so these are the rotation groups in RP and in RQ, and um, so simply they look uh, like this. You take a curve in the first quadrant. This will be x-axis, y-axis. And uh, so given such a curve C, I will consider a surface M um, that consists of all points x, y in Rp cross Rq uh, such that if you take the length of x and the length of y, that's a point in the first quadrant, two non-negative numbers. Uh, this has to belong to the curve C. And the idea is that uh, you take this curve C and you swing it around this axis um, in Q dimensions. So the group SOQ uh, rotates around this axis. axis um, and you also swing it around this axis, so this is where SO So you, uh, you swing it around this axis in P uh, dimensions, and what you get is a, uh, a hypersurface in, in RP cross RQ um, that is completely determined by this curve. Okay. Um, so now we're going to, if you consider mean curvature flow, then you consider the uh, evolving surfaces. So we could let this, if you, if you have a family of these things, you can let the surface evolve by letting the curve evolve. And now you can ask, what, is, uh, what condition do you have to impose on C for this to become uh, mean curvature flow, for M to, uh, to undergo mean curvature flow? And I'll write down the equation. You can do this in more generality. You don't have to look at, uh, so I drew a graph of a function, which is what I'll be talking about most of the time. But these things, uh, they can turn around like this. You're going to let them self-intersect, and um, they can do all kinds of things. So I'll stick to graphs most of the time. One condition is, uh, so what, is the, what do these curves, what does the curve C have to do? If you want this M to be a smooth surface, uh, what can C do at the axes? And the, so the condition is very simple. Um, uh, your curve C has to hit the axis perpendicularly. Um, so if this angle is 90 degrees, then uh, the corresponding surface that you get by rotating it around the axis will be at least C1, and if this thing is, uh, so if the curve C is uh, C2 and hits the axis perpendicularly, then M will be a C2 surface. Um, and in general, if you can extend it as a smooth, even function, then the surface M will be a smooth hypersurface. So those are, those are the boundary conditions that you have to deal with. And the same one appears here. So in particular, if you take a circle, the corresponding, uh, so this is 
meant to be a circle, quarter circle, the corresponding surface will be a sphere. So mean curvature flow is equivalent to a, uh, a PDE for the curve C. So if, if we assume that C is a graph, which this thing isn't, but then uh, mean curvature flow for the hypersurface uh, M uh, is equivalent to normal velocity equals the mean curvature, and that is equivalent to, and if you work out what these things are, sort of like a, what I did yesterday uh, for, the, for curve shortening, and uh, you, get, you get a PDE, and the main terms of these PDEs that we get are always, uh, the first term is pretty much always the same, it's this thing, which is, uh, comes from the curvature of this curve, seen as a plane curve, and then you get two extra terms which come from, uh, which are the curvatures that are produced by uh, rotating this thing around each of the two axes. Um, okay, the, so this is almost the same equation as yesterday. The only term that is new is this one in the middle. Um, which, so you could think of what we did yesterday as a special case of this where P was equal to one. Uh, if P is equal to one, then you have the, uh, the real line cross RQ, so that's RQ plus one, you get ordinary rotationally symmetric surface. If you set P equal to one, this term disappears, uh, and you get yesterday's equation. Um, so we're going to look at this PDE. Um, boundary conditions would be the uh, the graph has to hit this axis perpendicularly, uh, because if you do that, then the thing extends as a smooth hypersurface. Um, and then uh, we want you to stay away from zero, or if you, well, of course, you could say, well, I can evolve a sphere by mean curvature flow, so I should be able to evolve this thing. And um, if you want to do that, then it is not good to write the equation in this way, then you should uh, regard it as, you should choose different coordinates. You either uh, regard part of the solution where uh, y is a function of x, and then you regard the other part of, of the solution where x is a function of y. Um, so as a, uh, a very long calculus exercise, if you uh, if you switch coordinates, just x and y coordinates, you make x the independent variable, the dependent variable, and y the independent variable, then this is equivalent with uh, a PDE for v, and, and it's easy to write down that PDE because this is a geometric equation, so this, this, uh, this setup should hold no matter which p and q you take, and if you switch x and y around, what you're really doing is it's equivalent to switching P and Q around, so it should be this equation. Um, so if you ever have a calculus class where you think they should really practice the chain rule a lot, you ask them to derive that equation from this after you have inverted uh, <coughs> this function. Um, that is if you're not worried about your teaching evaluations. That's, Okay, so in any case, that's a fun fact. These two things are equivalent. Uh, geometrically, it should be clear. The calculation is, is sort of long and unpleasant. Okay, so we'll deal with this thing. Uh, so let me start with, uh, let's start with minimal surfaces. What minimal surfaces are there? So minimal surface is a surface whose mean curvature vanishes. Uh, in this context, they are solutions to this 
to mean curvature flow that don't depend on time. So I just take a, it's a solution of this equation where u is independent of time. So I just set this side equal to zero. What you get is an ODE. Um, So let's describe the solutions to this ODE. To begin, there is, um, there is one solution that in, in hindsight is obvious. There is the stationary cone, which you get by assuming that A is a linear function. So if you substitute this in here, a very quick calculation, the second derivative is zero, so the first term is gone. Uh, ux is, um, is equal to a, uh, u is equal to ax, the x's cancel, you find There's one particular uh, angle A, aperture A, for which this thing is a, is a stationary cone. Uh, so, so in particular, if P and Q are the same, and at some point I'm going to switch to the case where P and Q are the same, there's, just the, there's one particular reason why I want to spend the first couple of minutes talking about uh, allowing P and Q to be different. Um, but so once we've done that example, I'll just, I'll just pick values for P and Q. Okay, so there's, there's a cone like this. Um, it's a cone, it's a generalized cone because it sits in, so the lowest dimensions that we're considering today are, uh, is dimension four because P and Q P and Q each have to be at least two-dimensional, otherwise we're just dealing with rotationally symmetric surfaces like yesterday, so we're not looking at that case anymore. So P and Q are both at least two, so that means the dimension of the space we're looking at, uh, the total ambient space, is at least four. Um, so that makes it difficult to visualize these cones, but... Uh, now this A, I'll call this thing A star because there will be other A's. Okay, so that, that thing has, uh, that's a stationary solution to mean curvature flow. At the origin, it is singular. If you rotate this thing around this axis and that axis, you will find that at this point, uh, it is singular. The, uh, the mean curvature of this cone is zero, but the mean curvature is just the average or the, the sum of all the principal curvatures. The principal curvatures each uh, themselves are not zero. Uh, so this thing, actually, if you calculate the total curvature of this thing, it's, uh, it, it blows up like one over r squared. It blows up like one over r uh, as you go up to uh, one over the distance to the origin. So the, total, the, the actual curvature of this surface becomes infinite as you approach this point. But the mean curvature, which is this quantity, is zero. Okay, so what other, so this, so, one famous example of this is Simon's cone, which is the one that you get by setting P and Q equal to, to four. So which it's, a, it's, a, it's this thing in R8. And so, so in short, the, uh, so these things are stationary cones. They're sometimes called, they're called minimal surfaces. That does not mean that they are, uh, that they actually minimize the area. Um, it turns out that if the dimension is at least, uh, so for example, Simon's cone and all the ones in dimension eight or higher with one exception uh, are, are actually area minimizing, whereas the ones in dimension below eight are not area minimizing. So I'll, in, the next, in the next half hour, I'll explain all that and show why that's true. Okay, so, um, so in any case, there's a difference between minimal cone and minimizing cone. A minimizing cone is one that actually has least area, they, where you can't uh, find something that has smaller area. 
Okay, so what other minimal surfaces are there? So, um, Okay, so let's analyze this uh, minimal surface OD, and uh, one thing to notice about this is that it is invariant under scaling. If I uh, multiply x and u by the same constant, then uh, all terms scale in the same way. Yeah? Yeah, I should, I should not use, thank you. Um, let me give this thing a name. Minimal surface OD. Um, okay, so this is a, a straightforward ODE analysis. You, you look, uh, so the equation is invariant under rescaling. It's a non autonomous second order differential equation, so that's just a little bit beyond what, you, what, in the, what the textbooks tell you how to solve. Um, so what you do is you pick two scale invariant quantities. And you write down the equations, the ordinary differential equations for this. So you calculate Wx and you calculate Zx, and it turns out the equations are nicer if you calculate these things. Uh, this one was that, and this becomes, and uh, now, You get, you get two, uh, so in particular, if you let x is log, and so I should use t, so let me say theta, then um, x d dx is, d, is w theta. What I get, so this is a calculation that you can verify. Right, and it follows, it follows from that ODE. That's second order OD. So this gives you a system of two autonomous uh, ordin first order ordinary differential equations. So it leads to a phase plane. Uh, x is, sorry, theta is log x. Sorry. So dd theta is x ddx. Um, And, and one, so when you're doing calculations with this kind of ODE, uh, the actual theta is not an important parameter, and if you don't want to keep track of what, what theta is in relation to x, you could say, um, x, you could just add x as extra variable and say x theta is, well, what is it? x theta would be x d dx of x, x. Also, if you're programming this on a computer and you want to plot diagrams, you just run this system of three ordinary differential equations, and if you want to plot, say, W versus X, uh, you plot the solution of this one versus the solution of that one, right? So this. Okay, so in your standard undergraduate uh, differential equation class where you study phase planes, what do you do? You, you try to find the fixed points, you linearize at the fixed points, uh, you look for the lines where w theta is zero, you look for the curves or the curves where z, uh, z theta is zero, and that gives you the following picture. Sorry? Okay, so, yeah, uh, let me erase this.
this equation is invariant under rescaling. If you multiply x and u by the same same constant, then uh, you get uh, you get something that satisfies the exact same equation again. And so, therefore, you look for uh, look for So the ratio between x and u is invariant under scaling, and the ratio between du and dx is also invariant under scaling. Right, so we pick these, and so others that you could have you could have taken u divided by x, you could have taken. Um, in a sense, this one would have been a better variable to choose because it. Um, um, this one is singular when u is equal to zero, so, and so for today that's not going, to bother, not going to bother us. A different thing that you could have done is to say, here's the x, y plane, here's my solution to mean curvature flow. Um, you could look at these two angles. And write down differential equations for those, and that's that's it's equivalent to what we have over there. Uh, the derivation is a little longer; trigonometric functions show up, and, uh, but it's it is somewhat nicer. Um, okay, so okay, so the phase planes that we get. So the um, for W and zeta and z are the following. So they're so. Let's see, z theta is zero, so I'll just draw this picture. So there are two fixed points. The origin is a fixed point and here's a fixed point, so there's the fixed point zero, zero. And this fixed point, when you calculate what it is, it's the point uh, a star, one over a star. Right, and this is, And so what interpretation do these uh, fixed points have? Uh, this one corresponds to the cone. So if you look back at the cone, uh, on this cone you have uh, W is dy dx, that's a star, and z, that's x over y, that's one over a star. So uh, if your solution was this cone, the w and z that you get are constant and they, are the, they give you this fixed point. If you have a different solution that starts out here and that hits this uh, axis perpendicularly, then at this point we have um, x over u is, well, u is not equal to zero and x is zero, so this will be zero. And w is the u dx is also zero, okay? And um, the fact that here x is zero and u is not zero is the reason why we're looking at x over u instead of u over x. So this is uh, a decision that was made in hindsight, right? So, uh, you could have also chosen this one. If you choose this one, then the, uh, the fixed point that corresponds to the right boundary conditions actually is at infinity because uh, u will be non-zero and x will be zero. Okay, so all these, all these are, are trivial little facts that you discover by uh, experimentation. Okay, so there are two fixed points. The, uh, the differential equation goes like this. Right, so here everything goes up, here it goes like this. And now you can linearize at these, uh, at these two fixed points. And the linearization tells you that uh, the origin is a saddle point.
and should I do that? Or, um, let me not. Okay, so what you find, it's a saddle point. So briefly, what you do is you assume, uh, so you have W dot, so you, uh, at the origin, the linearizing is easy because um, you just, it amounts to writing down the differential equations, throwing away all nonlinear terms. So W dot is one plus W squared times Q minus one Z minus T minus one Q uh, W which is, so at the origin, w squared is roughly zero. So this, this whole thing is one plus something small, and these are linear terms, so you just get q minus one. You get this, and z dot is z minus z squared w, which is roughly z. So at the origin, the differential equation is It's roughly given by this linear system of differential equations. Uh, and then you look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, and it's upper, so you see the eigenvalues. There's one positive eigenvalue, one, and there's one negative eigenvalue, so that's why it's a saddle point. Um, the, um, I'm going to reproduce this picture later, so. So at the origin, we have uh, an unstable direction, which turns out to be in this direction. There's another one going in the other direction, but we don't care about that. Um, we only care about uh, W and Z that are positive. Um, and then there's the stable direction is, is, turns out, the stable manifold turns out to be just the, the vertical axis. axis. Okay, now if you linearize at the other fixed point, this fixed point, um, it's a bit more complicated. So this, uh, the results that you get are dimension dependent. Uh, so linearization. So if p plus q is less than eight, it turns out only to depend on the sum of p and q. So I won't do the calculation. It's similar to this one, and it just you know, I'm finding the, the eigenvalues of a two by two matrix. Um, so you get this situation, or there's this situation, and then for the, for the algebra, it actually doesn't matter. This lower bound doesn't matter, but for us, p plus q will never be less than four. Uh, here you get complex eigenvalues. minus alpha plus or minus i beta. And there are formulas for those. And so uh, for later on, the only important case that at some point I'll switch just, and I'll, I'll assume that p and q are both equal to two, which is the lowest dimensional example that we can consider. But it's, it's still typical for the others in this range. Uh, in this case, alpha is one half and beta is uh, one half squared seven. So, right? so these are very specific numbers. And if p plus q is bigger than eight, then the eigenvalues that you find are real, uh, and both of them are negative. Uh, so, and so here, the, uh, for when you have complex eigenvalues, they're complex, but the real part of the eigenvalues is also still negative. So what this means is that this still is, this is a sink. So it's attracting. If you're near this fixed point, the differential equation will draw you in at an exponential rate into the fixed point. And exponential is 
exponential in the variable theta. So it'll be e to the constant times theta, e to the eigenvalue times theta, which in our case is x to the, x to the power of lambda. So. Okay, so let me draw the pictures. Um, so, so for people's cube, if the dimension is between four and seven, uh, this is a, a complex eigen. This thing has a complex eigenvalue, and the uh, so the, the solution that has the right uh, that is that has the right boundary conditions is a solution that starts here. Since this is a saddle point, there's only one of those, and what it does. is it spirals into that, uh, that fixed point. Okay, so that's the phase plane. Now, what kind of minimal surface does that represent? I'll get to that in a second, but let me, let me also draw the, uh, the phase plane for, uh, for the other dimensions. So I'll let me do that. Um, let me do that here. So this is now, uh, has two real eigenvalues, so that means it's, it's still exponentially attracting, and there are two, two eigenvectors. Uh, one of the eigenvectors has a larger eigenvalue than the other one, so most orbits will approach this thing according to the slow, in the direction of the slow eigenvector. These eigenvectors have roughly this direction. So uh, what happens if p plus q is greater than or equal to eight is most of the time, the solution look, just looks like this. monotonically. Uh, now, just from the information of the linearization, uh, you, can't, you can't say that this is true. Uh, the only thing you can conclude is that the solution starts here, and once it approaches this fixed point, it will either go in from this direction, that direction, that direction, or that direction, and it could actually have looped around a couple of times before reaching there getting there. So how do you know whether it loops around or not? And these are, so one thing you can do is you could try to produce barriers. So if you could produce uh, a specific, an explicit curve here, like a sub-solution uh, where the arrows are all pointing inwards, then you know that the, uh, the orbit cannot cross this curve. And you would know that it doesn't loop around. Um, on the other hand, if you could produce a barrier like this, then you know that the orbit cannot monotonically approach this point and it has to loop around at least once. Okay, so uh, and since these are very specific differential equations, constructing these barriers is something, um, it's trial and error. Um, and so this is true for all, so uh, the result is uh, that this is true for all p plus q bigger than or equal to eight except P is two and Q is six. So for P is two and Q is six, we have this situation. It does this. It loops around once. So in particular, it crosses this, this line exactly once. So let me put, uh, mention some names. Um, so there are a bunch of papers um, so this phase plane is studied by uh, Alan Carr. Um, there is, um, let's see, there's a book by Gary Lawler. It's an AMS um, memoir, which, which contains all this information and much more. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a textbook after extending all earlier results. And there is, so that last one, the P, P equals two, Q equals six. This was done by uh, Noyce. Uh, 
and I'm a bit confused about the, the order in which this was done because this was that was that's the oldest one that I know of. Um, then this came later. And there is another paper by M. Q. Wang <coughs> that appeared a bit later. Contains more information, and then this book showed up. Um, okay. So. What do the minimal, corresponding minimal surfaces look like? Yeah. They are, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, no. It's, uh, so these are all pictures of the same phase plane with different values of P and Q. Right, so now we'll draw the XZ plane, the, sorry, the XY plane. And the, the easiest way to convert these phase diagrams into um, into XY diagrams is just to keep track of the variable Z, which is, uh, which is the ratio between uh, which is y divided, which is x divided by y. And y, I use y and u interchangeably. Uh, so let's start with this one. So, right, so uh, initially um, x over u is zero, that means that x has to be zero and u can be any positive number. Now which positive number should it be? Uh, we got these differential equations by getting rid of, uh, rid of the scale invariance. So that, that means for each solution that we find here, we get a one parameter family of solutions to the minimal surface equation. If you have a minimal surface and you magnify it or shrink it, it is again a minimal surface. So that means that the, uh, the initial point here is something we can choose, and I'll just pick the number one. Okay, so now what does, um, what does Z do? Z increases. Remember, z is x divided by u. Uh, so in the x u plane, uh, x over u is essentially the, this angle, or it's the tangent of that angle. Right? So uh, this angle increases, and then decreases, and then increases, and then decreases, and increases, and decreases, and so on and converges to the, uh, the aperture of the uh, stationary cone. All the while, uh, along that curve, um, W, which is ux, is positive. So that means that the solution is strictly increasing. So we get a, an increasing function, and that oscillates. It oscillates around the minimal cone. Uh, and converges to it. It's asymptotic to the minimal cone. Okay, and now any dilate of this thing is again a minimal cone. So if I take this thing and I try to, I shrink it by a factor of two, uh, I get a drawing I shouldn't attempt. Right, so any, any dilate of this thing is again a minimal surface. And they, they cross each other. Right, so those are all the ones that you get from here. These are not area minimizing. Uh, so they are minimizing there's not a symmetry there. Sorry? So the right. Yeah. But uh, these are against this cone. Let's see, sorry, the, the cones are not area minimizing. So I'll, I'll show you in a second that this thing, uh, so that, yeah, so I'll, I'll draw that exact picture that you're thinking of. Yeah. Okay, so here the situation is as follows. 
uh, where in this situation, what happens is that uh, ux being w is still positive, so the solution, the minimal surface that we get is that it's the graph of a strictly increasing function, and the angle uh, decreases monotonically and converges to that of the, uh, the stationary cone. So. We get this. Note that this thing is star-shaped, meaning if I draw a straight line from the origin out, it will intersect this graph only once. That follows from the fact that it's convex. Uh, it's convex because, why is it convex? It's convex because um, uxx is the derivative of ux is wx, and w is increasing along this curve, so therefore this is positive. Um, Also, x divided by u is decreasing, so therefore every line intersects this thing exactly once. Uh, so if I look at, so, and that's an important observation because it means that if I look at dilates of this thing, they're all disjoint. Okay, so the orange curve is the one that I show that I got by starting here at height one. All the other ones are just magnifications or reductions of, uh, they're, they're all, uh, you get them from the orange one by multiplying with a fixed constant. Particularly if I choose the constant to be A, then so this one is exactly A times the orange one. Okay. Uh, so, in this case, what you see is that the, the complement of the cone is foliated by minimal surfaces, right? There's a, uh, so if you swing these th things around the axis, you get smooth minimal surfaces, you get a whole bunch of them, they fill up the whole space, uh, and there's exactly one through each point. And then there is the, uh, the exceptional case, the Simois case, This is the minimal cone, the, uh, the exceptional one. What does it do? Uh, Z increases, hits this value, which is the, uh, the aperture of the, um, of the stationary cone, hits it once, and then goes back to, converges to the cone. So this thing looks like that. And if you take dilates of this thing, they intersect. Right, so these things, uh, these things do not foliate uh, the whole space. Um, okay, so go, let's compare areas. So I'm going to erase, I think we're done with these pictures now, so get rid of these. Okay, so let's look at the case where p plus q is between four and seven. We have this cone, and then um, this, the, the thing about the foliation, well, yeah. We're in this situation, and these things don't foliate the whole, uh, the complement of the cone, because they all intersect each other. But if I only look at this particular piece, I take the segment of my minimal surface and just take the piece until the first intersection with a cone, then I could look at dilates of that, and those would foliate um, the complement, because why is that? Each line intersects this thing exactly once, and that's because along, along this, so we're looking, we're looking at this part of the solution, right? This is the right height. 
along this part of the solution, Z is strictly increasing, and Z was the angle from the vertical, or the tangent of the angle from the vertical. So this, this thing is star-shaped, and all dilates of this thing uh, foliate the cone. So let me call this thing M, and then if this is A, then this one would be A times M. Uh, this part, I'll call that C. That's the cone, C. Um, I want to compare the areas of M and C, and so now there's a, once, if you have a foliation like this, there's a trick that allows you to compare these areas that I want to explain. Um, So it's a, it's a, I think in minimal surfaces it's a well-known trick. It, it turned out to be useful in recent things, uh, recent work on ancient solutions with uh, Natasha Sesum and Daskalopoulos, um, where we applied something like this in a different context. So what you do is the following: if you have, um, if you have a foliation by surfaces like this, what you can do is you can look at the unit normals to these uh, surfaces. Right, so at each point, there is one of these minimal surfaces that goes through that point. It's unit normal, that's, that's, that's new at this point. So it's a vector field that's defined on this whole domain, this whole region. And I'm drawing, making a two-dimensional drawing, but we're, I'm now thinking of this region as you swing it in, sitting in R, P plus Q. Um, so that's new. Um, an important thing about new is that it is divergence-free. If, uh, if you have a foliation and you look at, you take the unit normal vector field to the foliation, uh, the divergence of that is minus the mean curvature. And so let me, let me not explain why that's true, uh, at least not in detail. Um, so what is, how do you get the, the mean curvature? How do you get the principal curvatures? You have a surface like this, and at each point you have a unit normal. So this is epsilon times unit normal, and this is a unit normal. So you have a unit normal at each point on the surface, and as you move the point along on the surface, the unit normal uh, rotates. So you can differentiate along the surface, you can differentiate the unit normal along the surface, and that gives you, uh, so that gives you a linear map from uh, tangent vectors to tangent vectors, because as you differentiate the normal, the tip also moves parallel to the surface. And the eigenvalues of that linear map are the principal curvatures, and the sum of those is the mean curvature. So the trace of that linear map is the, uh, is the mean curvature. So what you do, so those are the derivatives. So the divergence is the sum of all the derivatives of nu in along uh, all perpendicular, uh, perpendicular set of directions. And that includes all directions tangential to the surface plus one perpendicular to the surface. And now, um, that extra term doesn't matter because if you move the vector field perpendicular to the surface, it may rotate because the surfaces are, they're not all parallel, they're not flat, so it'll rotate a little bit, but its direction will be perpendicular to the vector 
in which you're moving, and when you take the trace, you take the dot product with that vector, so that extra term is zero. Okay, so there's, there's an explanation like that for why this is true. Um, okay, so in our case, these things are all minimal surfaces, so therefore, Okay, so we have a divergence-free vector field, and that means that you must apply Green's theorem to something. Um, So let this region be R, then zero is the integral over R of the divergence of nu uh, dx, or d volume, and that is the integral over the boundary of R of nu, and now the unit normal, the output unit normal to R, can't call it nu anymore, so we'll call it n, with respect to area. And so the boundary of R consists of three components. In this picture, you might be tempted to include this part in the boundary, but it's not. We're rotating this around the axis. These are all interior points. So the boundary consists of this part. It consists of M and of the cone C. And the unit normal N will be uh, outward here and outward there. So if I, uh, this is, So the difference between this unit normal n and that unit normal n is that they are all pointing upwards. Okay, so this one, this n is that one, this n is minus that one. Okay, so n, I'll draw the n's in orange and okay. And now if you look at these two integrals, on M, we're taking the dot product of the unit normal vector field to uh, the minimal surfaces and the output unit normal. But this part of the boundary is one of the unit normal unit uh, is one of the minimal surfaces. So on this part of the boundary, in this term, nu and n are the same. So it's just the length of a unit vector. It's just one. So the first thing is just the area of M, of this piece. And the second part is minus the integral over, over C of N dot nu. Okay, so this is zero. We started by saying zero is equal to all this. So the conclusion is that these two things are equal. The area of M is the integral of N dot nu over C. And so this shows you that the, the cone is not minimizing. Because it's a dot product of these two vectors and that, uh, that dot product is strictly less than one because they're nowhere parallel. <coughs> and so uh, this is the area of C. So the conclusion is that the area of M is less than the area of C. So uh, the cone is not minimizing, uh, this thing is minimizing, or this thing has smaller area. And now a similar argument will actually show that uh, uh, if you prescribe this boundary value, this is the minimizer. Uh, and then as a curiosity for this, so this is a general argument in this particular case, uh, what do we, there's a, a curious, you know, as a curiosity, there's this one observation about this integral, namely that the thing that we're integrating is the dot product of nu and n over this part of the boundary. So if I draw that again. Uh, 
I would have to take at each point here, this is n, and this will be nu, and I have to calculate that at each of these points. And the, um, so the point is that it's constant. It's the same two vectors at all points because these surfaces are dilates of each other, so uh, the normals at all of these points are exactly the same. So instead of saying, so I could say this is nu dot n, right, so, um, and th so that number is something that you, uh, you can read off from solving the ODE. Okay, so these things are uh, not minimizing. These cones are not minimizing. Um, this thing that I told you is true if the dimensions are between four and seven, and so the uh, Simois cone is curious in the sense that it, the same argument applies there. So remember that in the case P is 2, Q is 7, the, the minimal surfaces look like this. So we had that initial segment that um, we can apply the exact same argument. And so the curiosity of this, uh, of this example is, um, is the numerical value of that dot product, the angle between these two. Um, So if you haven't seen this before, this is kind of weird. Right? The, the, the picture that I drew for you for Simois cone is that the thing goes around, it loops around, and then does this, right? And I, so particularly the curve hits this, um, hits this thing, and somewhere over here, this is where it intersects the cone. This is ux, the cosine, ux is the slope of that thing, so you can read off, uh, that dot product you can read off from the w coordinate at this point. Okay, so how did Simois prove that this happens? He, uh, in 1975, it was a numerical calculation. He ran probably Fortran with punch cards. And, um, and the reason that this is very difficult to do by hand, I don't think anyone has done this by hand, um, so it's, and we really, we're talking about this system of differential equations where Q is six, so we have a five here, and P is two, so there's a one. So it's, it's just, it's this system of differential equations, extremely specific. Um, this distance, so this distance is square root five, you know, between two and three. This distance is about 10 to the minus five. Uh, so this drawing is really a gross exaggeration. What it really looks like is it's indistinguishable. Right? It does this, where if you magnify this 100,000 times, you see something like that. Uh, so there's a numer so, and then of course there's a numerical calculation with uh, interval arithmetic, so it's probably rigorous, and then other people have uh, confirm the same thing using different approaches. You can, you, with inter, integer arithmetic, you can produce barriers, so this, this is, it's true. It's, um, the, uh, so this distance is also something of order 10, 10 to the minus five. And to get this dot product, you have to take the cosine of that number, essentially. And so you get the cosine is one minus that number squared. So for the Simois cone, uh, the ratio, so for the Simois cone, um, this cone and this minimal surface, this minimal surface beats the area of the cone by, by an incredibly small number. 
right? So the cone is, is not minimizing, but it's, it's almost there. It's really, uh, and so, um, and I don't know of any reasonable explanation of why, there sh why these really small numbers have to show up. It's, uh, so. And, and so it's difficult to do that because it's just one example, right? Okay, so. Then the other cases, so if p plus q is greater than or equal to eight and q is not two and p is not two, then um, you get this foliation by minimal surfaces on the outside uh, that never touch the cone. And if you flip them around, you also get them on this side. So using this foliation, you can show that the cone is actually minimizing, right? So, and the argument is, is very similar to the one that I erased, to, to the one that, yeah, to this argument. Again, you take the unit normals, so now all of space except the origin is foliated. Um, you have this divergence for unit normal vector, unit vector field everywhere. Um, if you assume, if there were something like this that were minimizing, uh, you apply Green's theorem and you'll find that the area of this thing is bigger than the area of the cone. Um, and, and you don't need symmetry for that. It's uh, so. Another application of these minimal surfaces is that um, if you look, if you remember the, the example of the cross that, uh, you know, two crossing lines and you evolve them forward time by curve shortening, you get fattening. Um, so we're done with these. So this, info, so under mean curvature flow, this is a picture in R2, two crossing lines. What you, this is, so this is the example that we saw yesterday. Uh, you, get, uh, you get many different ways of, of evolving this in forward time, and so you, uh, you get a non-unique solution, uh, or you get the viscosity solution fattens, uh, develops an interior. Uh, if you were, if you replace this cone, so what is this cone? This cone is just a set of all x, y in R2, where x is equal to y in absolute value. Uh, if you replace this two, so this is R1 cross R1, right? So this is the case, p is one, q is one. Um, if you replace p and q both by four or higher numbers, you could say, I have this cone here, how does it evolve in forward time? And um, the presence of all these minimal surfaces shows you that the cone, the forward evolution of the cone is the cone itself. It doesn't move. It's a fixed point for the flow. It does not fatten. Why is that? It follows from the maximum principle. Um, and the reason is, so the, the quick explanation is, draw this again. Suppose I start with this cone as initial condition for mean curvature flow. The, uh, the viscosity solution, the, the large, so the union which contains all possible other solutions, um, has the property that it, it obeys the maximum principle. And so it will avoid all smooth surfaces. If you have a smooth solution to mean curvature flow um, that is disjoint from the initial value of your um, of your viscosity solution, then they will always stay disjoint. And I'm lying a little bit because the smooth solution has to be compact, but so you can fix that in this example. Um, okay, so if you start with this thing, it's initially disjoint from, from this minimal surface, and that minimal surface under mean curvature flow does not move. Um, therefore, the, whatever solution comes out of this, uh, this cone has to stay disjoint from that minimal surface. Um, and I could, 
So we have many of these, and that argument applies to all the minimal surfaces that I have above here. So therefore, the forward evolution of this cone, the stationary cone, um, actually uh, stays on this side of the cone. It could go to the other side, but uh, in this condition we have, uh, on the other side, you can flip the axes around and you have a foliation with similar surface on this side. Okay. The, uh, the exceptional case where P is two and Q is six um, has the following feature. So this case, so this is the case P is two and Q is six. And here, if you switch the axes around, you have to switch the P and Q around. So the, the surfaces that come from this axis are the ones that correspond to Q is six and P is two. And those all stay on this side of the cone, right? So it's only the ones with P is two and Q is six that cross the cone. So we do have a foliation on this side um, by minimal surfaces. So that means the forward evolution of this cone stays, stays above the cone. On the other hand, um, I can approximate this cone by taking this segment and that segment. And now if you, um, if you had a viscosity solution to this, any test function, so this thing would, uh, in forward time, uh, you can make this thing arbitrarily small. So this thing in forward time will start evolving outward and go monotonically upward. Uh, so you, you can use this thing to prove that uh, if you start with Simois cone, it will fatten, but only on one side. So the forward evolution of this thing stays, one, and one boundary of the forward evolution is the cone itself, and the other one is a solution that comes out in this direction. Okay, so, yeah, that's, that's everything for minimal surfaces in great detail, I think. So the next, um, so I'll start a little bit now and then complete this tomorrow. Uh, we'll look at expanders and shrinkers. So what happens when you look at expanders and shrinkers? The ODE becomes a bit more complicated. So what are the extra two terms? And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to stick to the case where P plus Q is less than, uh, less than eight. So there should be no expanders. Uh, there are no, so, and the reason for that is that there are no expanders or shrinkers coming out of this cone in this particular case. Um, so there are no expanders because an expander would be a forward evolution coming out of the cone that was not the cone itself. And this argument shows that those things don't exist. And there can be no shrinkers, and that's because if there's a shrinker, the shrinkers are uniquely determined by their cone at infinity, and the cone itself is a shrinker. So that's the only one there is. Um, so I'm going to stick to the case P plus Q less than, uh, less than eight, and uh, nothing is lost. So things simplify if you just assume that P is two and Q is two, so we'll do that case. Uh, so that, that simplifies this. And um, so, If a solution is self-similarly expanding or shrinker, as, uh, as described yesterday, then um, the time derivative is equal to uh, plus or minus one half u minus x u x, right? So this is if the solution is of the form uh, square root plus minus t u and so if you um, 
if you get rid of the time derivative, you put these two or ordinary derivatives on this side, you find So the ordinary, the expander shrinker equation is this thing where you have lambda is plus one half for expanders. Okay, so this equation is the same equation that we started with except for the, that we have non, something non-zero on the right hand side. Um, the, uh, the trick that we used, or the thing that inspired us to, you, to look at uh, that two-dimensional phase plane with the z and w variables is that the equation was invariant under rescaling, but now if you replace, so what happens if you replace x by ax uh, and u by a times u? If you do that, then each of these terms, you, uh, each of these terms, so as a physicist, uh, you would look at the, uh, the dimension, the units of each of these terms, right? So u has dimension of length, x has dimension of length, a second derivative is one over length, a first derivative has no units. Each of these terms has the, has the units one over length. So if you do this scaling, each of these terms gets, multi gets divided by a. These terms, this has dimension of length, this has dimension of, so x cancels, length cancels against length, this has dimension of length, these, this term gets multiplied by a. So if you do this scaling, what happens is that this whole equation gets an, gets an a squared here. So this uh, equation is not invariant on the rescaling space. Um, so that means that, um, so it is still useful to look at those, um, those scaling invariant variables, but you have to add a third variable uh, because you won't get a closed system of ODEs for those. So, um, I think, yeah, I have one, yeah, so I, I should stop here. So let me say, what will I do tomorrow? I'm going to analyze these equations and I'll show some particular, there are uh, examples of uh, smooth, uh, smooth shrink shrinkers that uh, become a cone. So their evolution under the mean curvature flow is that they turn into a cone and then they have several different expanders. So they converge to a cone, and that particular cone will have many, many uh, different ways forward evolutions. So I'll discuss that, and then as a continuation of that, I'll, um, uh, there are also non-self-similar non-self-similar solutions forward. Um, so and these examples show that um, they show that if you uh, so if you were going to look at varifold solutions or uh, solutions with not too bad singularities, all these solutions have only one singularity, namely at the origin. Um, the uh, if you wanted to use these things to say construct minimal surfaces by looking by using mean curvature flow as a gradient flow. Uh, there is a very, very severe non-uniqueness. Uh, the set of non-self-similar solutions. Uh, so here I'll construct expanders. There will be many of them. For the, for the stationary cone, there are infinitely many. Uh, but it's a discrete sequence. Here we get a whole continuum. So I can get, the, so depending on the cone, you can get, a, you could get an n-dimensional family of solutions where n can be arbitrarily large. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here and continue tomorrow.